Good day, I'm Alex Bainbridge. Welcome to The Green F Show. We're here today with Professor Mazin Kumseya, who's an academic and scientist from Palestine, currently doing a national speaking tour of Australia. Before we get underway, I want to acknowledge that this video was produced and recorded on stolen and unceded Aboriginal land, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Uh, also, if you like the work that we do, please become a supporter of Green Left if you're not already. It is the number one way to support our work as well as to produce, receive the content that we produce and plans start from just $5 a month. There's a link in the description below. Uh, as I said, we're here with Professor Mazin Kumseya. He's an academic, scientist, biologist and expert in human rights. He's the author of a number of books and he's the founder and director of the Palestine Museum of Natural History. He's also with the Palestine Institute for Biodiversity and Sustainability at Bethlehem University. I began by asking him to explain what message he wants to get to, across to Australian audiences during this tour. So uh, I'm here on, a, on my first trip to Australia and then I go to New Zealand. The idea is to speak about what's going on in Palestine, why we have a regional conflict now that's threatening to spread into a global conflict and how this impacts everybody and how peace and justice are really essential for survival of the human species. I speak about sustainability of human and natural communities in our region of the world, but also globally as a biologist, as an environmentalist. Uh, so I speak to diverse audiences uh, from high schools to university students, uh, to churches, to community centers about these issues, uh, hoping that we arrive at a common ground for sustainability of human and natural communities. Obviously, we're in a situation where there is this truly horrific genocide which Israel is perpetrating against the people of Gaza. But in some ways, you might consider, well, this is actually just an extension of a slower-paced genocide which has been going on for much longer since before 1948. I'm wondering if you will make some specific comments about Israel's genocide and um, you know, what your thoughts are about that, and also how can we stop this genocide? Uh, well, genocides in human history are many. There were hundreds of genocides just in the last uh, three, four centuries. Uh, you were talking about things like what happened with the Tutsis in Rwanda, the Armenians, the uh, Holocaust of, uh, you know, Armenians, the Holocaust of Jews, Gypsies, and Communists in uh, Nazi Germany and, and its occupied territories. Uh, there has been lots of genocides in human history. Genocides of natives is a common form of genocide for colonial powers, be it in the U.S., for example, with the European colonizers uh, there, or here in Australia, of course, with the Aborigines, mm -hmm. Aboriginal people. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is so, so it is understandable in the context of genocides that there is yet another genocide. However, I really think this is special in many ways and very unique. Uh, one is the timing of it is kind of late in the game of genocides uh, that is happening right now when they were talking about uh, 2024. You know, and uh, this is very unusual. Uh, the second thing that it is broadcast live, uh, there's TVs, there's, uh, you know, people on iPhones and, and smartphones recording their own killing and murder actually live. So the world gets to see it visually and effectively. And the third um, point that uh, is unique about this genocide is that it's supported by many Western countries, not like just one. The genocide of Aboriginal uh, people in Australia was uh, British responsibility. Uh, but, uh, but in our case, there are many Western countries that are supporting Israel in this genocide. Unfortunately, including the Australian government, which has uh, military deals with uh, Israel and supplies them with weapons to commit genocide. Uh, so that's a third and an important point about uh, participation of some Western countries in this genocide. The fourth point that I think is uh, also interesting about this genocide is that unlike 
previous genocides which were localized and would be limited eventually. For example, when King Leopold of Belgium basically committed genocide in the Congo to, uh, to keep the supply of cocoa and chocolates being made in Belgium, uh, that was, you know, uh, destroyed a lot of the Belgian uh, of Congolese-controlled regions, uh, but it did not become a global conflict. In our genocide, it is going to be a global uh, conflict, which could lead to basically um, a global war that this time will be devastating for humanity. Nobody will escape it. That's why Australia and everybody here should be aware that, uh, I mean, if you look at the package of aid that Congress, U.S. Congress just approved, it includes three areas, Ukraine, Israel, and uh, Taiwan and the South Pacific. South Pacific here because of conflict with China. So they're egging, the U.S. and Israel are egging for a global war which here in Australia you won't escape it with hypersonic missiles and nuclear technology the way it is, uh, lasers from satellites, etc. Star Wars essentially that could destroy our planet. Uh, this is the danger of it. So these four uh, areas that I say make this genocide kind of unique in world genocides. And hopefully it will be the last genocide if we move away from wars towards a peaceful uh, world. If not, then I guess uh, cockroaches will inherit the earth because they are resistant to radiation. Do you have any thoughts about how we can stop this genocide? Well, number one is awareness. People need to be aware. Hence, I take time out of my busy time in Palestine where we're building an institute for biodiversity and sustainability, and I go speaking around the world. Hence, I'm speaking four or five places a day in Australia, and then New Zealand, and then I plan to go to South America. I think awareness raising about these issues, so they are not, uh, you know, kind of dismissed with the usual uh, rhetoric of colonizers, <coughs> such as the rhetoric of uh, colonizers, quote-unquote, defending themselves against indigenous people who are besieged and placed in cantons and concentration camps. Uh, this rhetoric needs to be challenged. Truth-telling is very, very critical for our work. For humanity's sake, we need to have truth. We need to find out what really is going on in in our region because, as I said, it impacts the whole world and we are already seeing the regional uh, spillover into conflicts with Iran and Yemen and Syria, etc. Uh, so I, I really think that truth-telling is very important and this leads to action. So you, you speak truth to power and then you act on it. And what we see already in global movement, for example, uh, around the universities around the world, over 300 universities now around the world are engaged in producing camps. You know, students are camping in the universities, demanding their universities stop this genocide, stop cooperating with Israeli academics, stop uh, doing joint uh, research related to military, etc. Now, I understand you have described this both as a genocide, but also as an ecocide. I'm wondering if you can talk more about this ecocide character of what Israel is doing. Yeah, this is very important because people, of course, uh, focus on violence and sp spilled bloods of people. But people uh, can suffer because of the environmental issues. And so it's uh, essential to also address those. Uh, in my uh, studying of history, I see all colonizers destroying the environment whenever they go to a new country, be it in South Africa, you know, the Dutch and the British colonizers and their mining activities, or here in Australia, 
or in the US, for example, when the Europeans killed two to three million buffaloes to deny the natives, indigenous people, the, uh, the food they were using. That altered the environment, damaged the environment. The same applies in our case. The Zionist colonization of Palestine uh, from very early on started doing damaging things to the environment, including, for example, diversion of the water of the Jordan River from Lake Tiberias to the west uh, to replace uh, rain-fed agriculture with uh, irrigated agriculture on that part of the country. But in so doing, they deprived uh, the Jordan River basin of its water Jordan River dropped from 1,350 million cubic meters per year to only 20 million cubic meters per year. That's a stream, basically no wider than two yards uh, in length. And uh, this is devastating for both the people and nature, of course. Same thing happened with drying up the wetlands of the Hula area and the lake Hula, which uh, removed 219 species but also removed the communities they caused. They literally ethnically cleansed 12 villages around the Hula area. And when Israel was created in 1948, they ethnically cleansed over 530 Palestinian villages and towns, destroying all the trees around them, whether it's domesticated trees like olives and figs and almonds, or uh, wild trees like oaks and carob and hawthorn. And they replaced this by, in some places, doing um, agriculture, uh, doing forestry by one kind of tree, which is pine tree. So they replaced a pluralistic, you know, uh, multi-agricultural uh, production with one tree, which is pine tree, which is the wrong type of tree. In Europe, that tree works well especially in Northern Europe, but in Palestine it doesn't work so well in the dry climate. Its leaves are acidic, actually, they cause no undergrowth, uh, but it's also susceptible to fire in a dry climate. So we have a lot of fires that removed this monolithic culture of pine trees, and, uh, and this caused a lot of damage to the ecosystem. So yes, indeed, uh, colonization is an ecocide. Uh, uh, you know, it's also a cultural uh, genocide, you know, destroying the people's connectivity to the land, their ethnic cultural heritage, uh, the languages spoken in Palestine. Everything that has to do with the people and land is destroyed. Well, that was the next question I was going to ask, actually. Can you talk about the connection between social justice and human rights on the one hand and solving environmental problems on the other? Uh, they are interconnected because people are interconnected to nature. When you have people like my ancestors who invented agriculture, we have to remember that the first domestication of plants and animals happened in our region, what was called the Fertile Crescent. <coughs> and Palestine is the western part of this Fertile Crescent. This happened about 12,000 years ago. And so these ancestors of us who were able to develop domesticate plants and animal plants like wheat and barley and lentils and chickpeas and animals like goats and sheep and so on, and developed that settled uh, communities, uh, gave, this gave the rise to civilizations. Hence, the Fertile Crescent also is considered the cradle, as it's called in, uh, by anthropologists and archaeologists, the cradle of civilizations. Um, so, but in terms of people and land, obviously, if that's what they developed and they lived with the land, the relationship of the environment and the people is integral. If I make it simpler to understand, the integral of the people, Aboriginal people in Australia, to the land and their ability to live off the land evolved over thousands and thousands of years. It is not easy to break this bond that is between a person who's evolved, even biologically, I say as a biologist, our physiology 
uh, evolved because of the land that we were on. The bacteria, the fungus, even the things in the air that we breathe uh, gave our immune system a different immune system than, let's say, European colonizer coming to that country. I lived in the U.S. and uh, I'm, I was not very healthy. When I went back to Palestine in 2008, I felt much healthier in the past 16 years than when I was living in the U.S. Because, again, my biology has evolved over thousands of years to be co-adapted with our environment, with our food, with the way we breathe the air, even the air that's around us, the soil bacteria, uh, etc. So, hence you find uh, also in industrialized societies a lot of diseases like autism and autoimmune diseases, etc., that are evolving now, new diseases, as they call them, uh, that are spreading in Western societies because of the lack of connectivity to the land and to the nature and to the food that we live on this land. I also wanted to ask you your opinion about rich world countries like, I mean, definitely the United States, but also Australia and Germany, other Britain, other countries as well, that are actively giving support to this Israeli genocide. How do you understand that? What what what? Oh, I guess, what's your comment about that? And I think many people with their eyes open would already see that Western countries have got n nothing in the way of moral legitimacy. But in the West, there is a, in the population, there is a, there is a certain sense that people feel like the West is on the right side of history. But in this case, it's very clearly not. Yeah. Can you make some comments about that and, and, and what this might mean for the future? Well... My background is biology and medical genetics, but I'm also very interested in history and how these things evolve. I read a lot of books, a lot of history. For example, I found that actually the idea of Zionism has a connection to Australia. It started in 1842 when the British government hired Lieutenant Colonel George Gowler, or Gowler, I guess you say his name, the city named after him in Australia. He was governor of uh, South Australia, second governor of South Australia. And uh, they hired him to look into establishing Jewish colonies in Palestine. So the British government certainly uh, was involved very early on, from the 1840s. They even accepted his recommendations, presented it to Parliament, which approved it and the British government allocated funding to support this colonization project. At the time, they called it Jewish colonization of Palestine. Uh, and they set up a Jewish colonization association even. Uh, so you see that very early history of Western powers, who themselves are colonizers, of course, supporting colonization in different parts of the world. Uh, and it is uh, not, uh, not coincidence that the Western governments which support Israel, not their people, but the governments which support Israel, happen to be historically colonizing countries. Mm -hmm. Countries like England, uh, you know, United States, uh, Australia, France, etc. Uh, this, is, this has to do with both psychology, that colonization is still considered okay in those societies. Uh, second, it, it is that the privileged society, the rich, have their own rich club, if you want. They are associated. When I was in India, for example, the, uh, the uh, uh, what they call lower caste people invited me to speak, and I asked them why are they interested in hearing about Palestine when they have their own problem, homelessness in Mumbai, nearly a million people in the street. They said, because our enemy is the same. Bill Modi, uh, Prime Minister or President of India, I don't remember. But anyway, Bill Modi uh, is uh, friends with, uh, uh, with uh, Netanyahu, you know and friends with uh, George Bush, you know, they, they are club, you know, they, they get richer off of uh, uh, 
uh, of you know <laughs> of, of uh, misery of people, uh, indigenous people. Whether indigenous, uh, you know, Bolsonaro in Brazil was buddy buddy with Netanyahu and with uh, Modi of India, or or with Bush of the U.S. This this is typical that the since our enemy is like in this elite club that runs the world, they literally actually meet every year, like at uh, Davos at the uh, World Economic Forum, as they call it. But it's really a forum for business leaders and world leaders to come together and plot how to destroy more people's lives while making it look like they are for democracy and human rights. Mm. This, this is the hypocrisy of Western countries. Uh, if there is any positive thing about what is the genocide that's happening in Gaza, it is that it's dropping all these masks and people start to see it. You know, if you, as Australia, for example, Australia signed the Convention Against the Crime of Apartheid, and becomes local law when you sign such a convention, international convention. And yet Australia actually funds apartheid. Australia signed the international convention against the crime of genocide, which means it's actually obligated to even send ships and military to save the Palestinians being murdered in mass. 15,000 children so far have been killed. Um, but instead, again, Australia supports a genocide. This hypocrisy of Western governments, not the people, again, the Western governments, and I consider Australia part of the Western government system, if you want, uh, is, uh, is really uh, becoming so clear to so many millions of people around the world Hence, there are hundreds of millions actually going out in demonstrations. Hence, the movement on campuses around the world, including here in Australia. Uh, so, I am optimistic that this will, this dropping of the masks will allow finally for Western countries to live up to their rhetoric, to their rhetoric about international law about human rights, about democracy, about women's rights. Where is women's right when you blame, you know, Iran claiming that they force women to wear hijab, which is not true, but but if you are for women's rights, why don't you talk about the woman being tortured by Israel and the woman being killed deliberately by Israel in, in a genocide? Where is women's rights there? So I think it's important for us uh, as human beings to point out these uh, dualities of logic that, uh, you know, black is white and white is black, so to speak, that the media in the West and the, you, you know, governments in the West uh, always try to uh, convince us that there are certain things that are, uh, you know, like talking points, they regurgitate them. And people are getting tired of them. For example, the talking point about defending. Israel has a right to defend itself. Well, sorry, I mean, they use that so repeatedly. The Australian, you know, European colonizers here, well, they had the right to defend themselves against those indigenous people, aboriginal people who are attacking us for no obvious reason. And we have to shackle them and we have to beat them and we have to kill them. Or in the U.S. in the West, when they used to circle the wagons, we circled the wagon to protect ourselves from these uh, marauding, uh, vicious savages that are. Uh, we don't understand why they hate us. They're painting their face face red. Maybe it's for blood. Uh, maybe they are just genocidal. The, those natives are the genocidal people, not us who are killing them. 150 million natives estimated to be killed in North America and South America by the European colonization. 150 million, the largest genocide in human history. And then there was the genocide of slavery. We don't talk about that. You know, the, the millions of Africans who lost their lives 
uh, along hundreds of years of European slavery of the local people. You're a university professor, and one of the features of this genocide has been Israel's obliteration of universities in Gaza and also the targeting, targeted assassination of academics and intellectuals. I'm wondering if you can make some comments about that um, and including what would you hope for and expect from your academic colleagues in Australia? I mean, probably a fair, to, fair to say haven't been speaking out um, enough about this, or what has been known as a, a scholasticide. Can you comment about that? Uh, yes, Israel has destroyed the higher education system in Gaza. 90,000 students were denied higher education because Israel literally rigged the university buildings with explosives and blew them up. This is not a necessity of war. You've occupied the campus. Why do you want to blow up the buildings? It is to deny uh, Palestinians higher education. And to cause the ethnic cleansing of Gaza, Gaza is 2.3 million people. Uh, some 70% of them are refugees actually from 1948 ethnic cleansing. So they are already uh, suffered a lot and lived in this large concentration camp that is Gaza. 2.3 million people are in uh, 250 square miles basically. Uh, so, what is, what is the destruction of the education system about? And not just higher education, but also regular schools, even UN schools for refugees. What is the destruction of hospitals about? It is to deny normal living for people. So that even though you destroy the residence, you also, the residential building, 70% of them were destroyed. You also want to destroy all what makes for a living possible within the Gaza Strip. That includes healthcare system, water infrastructure, sewage infrastructure, roads, they literally bulldozed roads, destroyed them, all the infrastructure, the educational system, the schools, uh, you know, everything. Uh, this is this is what they aim to do. That's part and parcel of genocide, is that you are destroying not only the people, but any means for remaining people to go back and rebuild their life. Uh, so th this is the idea of it. Now, why is the West, again, you know, the hypocrisy of Western governments silent about this? Um, uh, due to some inflated thinking about the lobby and the Zionist lobby in Australia or America and what it can do to you. They use, uh, for example, weapons like uh, weaponizing anti-Semitism by claiming any criticism of Israel or of this genocide is anti-Semitic or anti-Jewish or things like that. Uh, which is ironic since many of the leaders of the people fighting for human rights are actually Jews who fight with us, with Palestinians, against the genocide. I was arrested, by the way, many times uh, for civil disobedience and nonviolent resistance, other forms of nonviolent resistance. And uh, half the times I was arrested, I was arrested even with Israeli Jews who are working with us, even very ultra-Orthodox religious Jews who are protesting this with us. So I think uh, the, the fear tactics they use um, to try and silence criticism in academia, uh, at the universities like U.S. universities, uh, the bribery, bribing people, and also uh, threatening people, and they silence presidents of universities, they silence people by either blackmail or bribery or both. And uh, they ensure that no... F but that's why students are rising and saying enough is enough, we're not going to take this anymore. It's our 1968 moments, you know, 1968 the universities went uh, protesting the Vietnam War, which is another imperialist war that caused two to three million Vietnamese deaths. That's also a genocide, you know. Uh, so I think there is some change now among the public. And the powers to be uh, is running scared. 
and they are trying to kind of cosmetically change their rhetoric a little bit. Uh, but it's not working, you know, and the people are seeing through it. You know, I visited in Sydney uh, an encampment of activists who are uh, staying 24 day, hours a day, seven days a week in front of uh, Albanese's office, your prime minister. He has an office in Sydney. And basically, uh, offices are now closed because he cannot come there and, and his staff cannot come there because they are blocking it. And they've done this for the past 20 some weeks, 28 weeks, I think. So I think it's, things are changing and I hope this global uprising of consciousness, a global awakening that's happening will lead to change in policies, uh, will lead to new representatives that really represent the will of the people and look for the interests of the people, be it Australians or Palestinians or Israelis or whoever, instead of looking for the interests of the rich and powerful. Do you want to say anything in particular about, say, academic boycotts or, I guess, the role of acad academics in Australia? What should academics in Australia be saying? Well, I have been an active in this for over uh, 30 years now. In the mid-90s, uh, I started the first academic boycott with a group of other academics, uh, Edward Said, others uh, in the U.S., where we collected thousands of signatures for an academic and cultural boycott of Israel. We're not boycotting individuals, we're boycotting institutions and people who represent institutions within the state of Israel. So obviously, you know, people who work with us in joint struggle would be welcome. Uh, but those who are part of the system, uh, we boycott them because uh, just like we did with South Africa and the academic and cultural boycott of, in South Africa, was very effective in pressuring the elites of that country to change their uh, views about the potential for a future if, if they maintain apartheid. Uh, it was not the economic boycott actually that was most effective in South Africa. It was the cultural and, and uh, academic and other boycotts, uh, athletics, so on. Uh, that made South African elites start to think, what's the future? Economic boycotts could develop and could become significant. But uh, apartheid was doing fine economically under uh, the system. Even to the last day, it was doing very fine. And you could always uh, circumvent uh, economic boycott, as we see happened with Russia and Iran and other countries. But uh, culture and academic boycott is very, very critical. It raises consciousness. It makes people aware of the immorality of supporting colonization and, and apartheid and genocide. So <clears throat> we encourage it and we support it. And we think everybody should participate in it. Uh, and everybody could participate in it. I mean, if uh, economic uh, boycotts in Australia, I'm not sure what Israeli products are here on the market, but they must be very rare. Uh, but culture and academic, you know, the Israeli consulates, they, uh, they bring people here to speak. Uh, we do demonstrations in front of those and make sure they don't happen. And this is uh, a kind of uh, boycott that everybody can participate in um, and can help. Thank you very much. Is there anything else you want to say before we finish up? So <clears throat> one of the things that we have done in Palestine, I don't like to just complain about uh, the system and the oppression, all of this. What are we doing to uh, create a better vision for the future and, and implement it? Our vision for the future in Palestine, as, as the indigenous people of the land, is a future where there's human diversity and there's biological diversity. And we think those two things are healthy for sustainability. So we started an institute largely by volunteer efforts 
hundreds of volunteers, including international volunteers that help us to develop this sustainability of human and natural communities, meaning you sustain humans by human diversity and by ensuring they have good production from the land, food sovereignty, things like that. And you sustain nature by sustaining biodiversity, biological diversity. This institute, we call it Palestine Institute for Biodiversity and Sustainability. The website is palestinenature.org, palestinenature, one word, dot org. And people can come and volunteer and they can support us in many other word, ways including from volunteering, by volunteering from abroad, they don't have to come there. But we welcome volunteers. We received volunteers from over 45 countries that come and stayed with us, including some Australians. And uh, we have room and board for the international volunteers, so they enjoy uh, experience of another life and another situation and, and culture and they get to contribute to our sustainability as human beings. Uh, and it's already become uh, basically an oasis of hope in the middle of a conflict, and this oasis of hope is spreading to other countries. We already gave our experiences to a number of other developing countries like Uganda and Egypt and Jordan, and they plan to build similar institutions. So I think we should envision uh, a, a better world and work for it, and that's what we are doing in Palestine. So I urge your listeners, your viewers, to, to join us in this and, uh, and support us, and uh, in doing so, you support yourself. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for making the effort to come to Australia, and thank you, thank you for your time today. Thanks for joining us today on The Green F Show. A big thank you to Professor Vazim Kumseya for spending the time with us today. As I said at the beginning, if you like the work that we do, uh, please become a Green F supporter if you're not already. Uh, pl plans begin at just $5 a month and it, is, it does make a big difference to our work. You can also support us on Patreon if that is your preference. And you can even share this video or this podcast, uh, give it a thumbs up, write comments, help the algorithm. Uh, and that, that makes a big difference even without spending a single cent. Uh, thanks for your time again today, and we will see you at the Palestine protests, we'll see you at the other um, actions on the streets, and we'll see you next time on The Green Left Show.